just want to welcome everybody to the July 2024 edition of NDSU Extension Agribusiness Agricultural Market Situation Update webinar. Uh, my name is Dave Ripplinger, um, Economic Specialist with NDSU Extension and mod moderator of the webinar. Uh, this month we'll have myself, Fran Olson, Tim Petrie, and Ron Haugen uh, making comments. Uh, we're happy to answer questions at the end of our presentations. Uh, you can use either the chat or the Q&A tool uh, to ask those questions at any time uh, during those presentations. Uh, today we'll begin with Frank Olson. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking a little time out of your day, a beautiful day today, uh, to, to listen to us and hopefully be able to answer some questions about what's happening in the grain market. So what I am going to try and do, as usual, uh, is go through the most use recent USDA information, both the WASDE report, the production report, and we have the acreage report that I'm also going to cover. So if you do have any questions or th think of things that you'd like to discuss later on, I do have my email as well as my contact information here. Um, uh, probably the cell phone is the most reliable because I do have some travel obligations coming up now in the end of July and, and into August. So I'll be kind of in and out of the office. So with that, let's just jump right in. Um, just kind of at a high level, what are some of the things that are really going on right now? Obviously, we did have uh, a, a kind of a, a whole set of USDA updates, some at the very end of June for the acreage and quarterly stocks report. And then more recently, um, the end of last week, we had uh, the production report as well as the WASD, the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates updates. So when you look at the numbers themselves, I would classify the numbers as neutral to negative for corn, soybeans, and wheat. And we'll go through those numbers just shortly here. But it wasn't, so the kind of the negative tone we have in the marketplace right now um, the, what I, the way I'm going to try and describe it and explain it is that really the USDA reports confirmed a lot of the existing biases. So again, recognizing that we're getting some additional data from USDA, the real question is, does that information either confirm or contradict what others in the marketplace are thinking and setting some expectations about what the future is going to bring? And right now in today's world, a lot of that expectation is really being driven by weather. This is typical for this time of year. Um, we start looking at that weekly crop progress report. The information I have here is from Monday. Um, and, and then, you know, looking at what's happening outside in the ag markets, as well as what's happening in geopolitical arena. And we'll talk a little bit about all of those. So crop progress report, what is the crop condition rating right now? Uh, for corn, this is as of the report that we got Monday, which was compiled over last weekend. Uh, currently, 68% of the corn is ranked good to excellent versus last year at this time was 57%. Soybeans, again, 68% good to excellent versus 55% last year. Uh, winter wheat, about 71% of the winter wheat has been harvested, pretty much cleaned up all of Kansas right now. We're getting at the tail end of, of, of Nebraska uh, uh, wheat harvest, winter wheat harvest, they're starting to move into portions of South Dakota now. So um, that, that winter wheat harvest is starting to move northward. So far, both quality as well as yields are coming in very good. Um, again, putting put it a bit of a negative tone into the wheat markets. Uh, currently for spring wheat, 77% uh, rated good to excellent versus 51% last year. So spring wheat, from my discussions with farmers, as well as grain elevator managers, talking a little bit about fungicide applications before we came on, um, as well as what's out going on on the Canadian side of the line. This is looking like it's going to be a very, very good spring wheat year. I think we're going to have good yield reports. It looks like it, right now, like we'll have some good test weight Uh a little bit early to tell what's going to happen with protein and protein content. Uh, fungicide, I know, is going on like crazy, which hopefully will help suppress some of the scab or the fusarium head blight issues and potentially some Dawn or vomit toxin issues. So there's still some things going on. We're still watching what's happening, but we're, we're in much better condition this time this year than we were this time last year. And to be very blunt, last year was not a bad crop year. It really wasn't. So when we think about national average yields, Kind of the total production for corn, soybeans, and wheat last year versus what we're seeing this year. The expectation in the market right now is we're going to have plenty of bushels. There's going to be plenty of inventory left to be able to meet our needs plus some. And that's really right now what's driving the mentality and the psychology of the marketplace. 
Okay, now globally, one of the things that keeps popping up, and I just wanted to give an update because I talked about this last month, um, the drought conditions currently uh, kind of hitting Russia and in particular Eastern Ukraine have been continuing. Um, it is starting to impact winter wheat yields and yield potential. Uh, we haven't heard any yield reports coming out of Russia yet, but the expectation is they're going to have some, some lower yields. They're still going to have a crop. There's still going to be some production in order to be able to sell. Uh, the big issue is how many bushels are they looking at? So let's look at the numbers very quick. I just want to highlight a few things because there's a lot of tables here. Um, please feel free to re replay this at, at a later date if you, if you want to go through it in more detail. So this is the information from the acreage report. So again, uh, prospective planning report came out in March. USDA does another follow-up survey of farmers to say how many acres did you actually seed versus what you were intending to seed. The blue uh, highlighted blue row on the very top is what the average trade estimate was. So this is kind of what the traders and analysts were thinking about, or what they were expecting. The highlighted black towards the middle is what the information we got from that March perspective planning report. And of course, on the very bottom, we have the red highlighted, which is the actual numbers we received. Now, I did include the 2023 planting as plantings from last year, just also as a reference point. So you get a better feel for how much of a change or shift we're really getting in some of these from last year. So we got updated information on what we expected planted. It's just a matter of what reference point do you use to say, did it go up and it, how much did it go up or did it go down? Okay, so I, what I really like to do is compare the blue line to the red one. And the reason I do that is, again, just to remind everybody, the blue is what the trade was expecting to see versus what did we actually see. So if you look at corn, which is really the one that had the surprise or kind of the shock value, we ended up planting about 1.3 million acres more corn than what we had first, than what the market was expecting. Okay, so we, you know, we were, the, the, the traders were expecting a number that might be a little bit bigger than the March, which is when you compare the black line to the blue, but it got to be much larger than expected. And of course, that kind of turned the tide for corn because we were coming into this marketing year with a little bit more corn in inventory than we had, uh, than we have for several years. And then you add on top of that, uh, uh, more acres planted than we expected. Now it's still down from last year. Notice last year was 94.6. This is 91.6. So about a 3 million acre cut from last year, but translation is the cut wasn't as large as what we had expected. Soybeans, the soybean number came in actually a little bit on the lower side. So when we look at what the March, March intentions were, versus what the trade was expecting in blue versus what we actually got, a slight cutback or reduction in, in soybean acres, which was somewhat supportive. Um, then we look at the all wheat, and I just wanna skip over to the spring wheat in the Durham because the winter wheat acres for both hard red winter and soft red winter, we had a pretty good real read on those going into that report. The real question was, well, how many acres of spring wheat in Durham were actually seeded? Uh, the spring wheat number came in pretty much right on what the trade was expecting, a small, smaller reduction, um, I mean, a little bit less number than they were expecting, but very close to what the, the uh, March survey was. We did get a slight uptick in Durham. So I think there was a slight shift away from spring wheat and into Durham basically because of relative prices. So the moral of the story, the big takeaway from this is that we got at the end of, of June, we got that acreage report and saying, yep, we're going to have more corn acres planted than we expected. How about production numbers? Now, again, these production numbers, oops, I forgot, yeah, um, came out on July 12th, again, which was a couple of, what, about a week ago. Um, there really wasn't any adjustment in the projected yield per acre. Uh, USDA sometimes will adjust up or down a little bit based on planting conditions and general weather report, but essentially you follow the trend line yield. The August report, and I wanna caution everybody now, the August report in about a month is going to be a really important one for yield and yield forecast, because that will be the first, year, first time that USDA uses farmer-based surveys so they ask, actually ask farmers, what does your crop look like? What do you think your yields are going to be? And combine that with what they call remote sensing or basically satellite imagery. Because by August, the crop should be far enough along that we'll start to get some general ideas of what is going on. I should, yeah, uh, what's going on. So they will have some updates in August, 
on yield and yield potential. Right now, we're really stuck at trend line yields. So the fact that we got a few more acres of corn planted than we thought, adding on a trend line yield, and all of a sudden we're looking at some pretty large bushel production. Um, we did get an update on um, production numbers, yield expectations, and again, a revision in the planted acreage for wheat by class. Um, I won't go through all of these numbers, but I do want to point out a couple of them. Let's look at hard red winter wheat, which is kind of in the middle here. We were expecting a, a, a slight increase from the June report. The U.S. The trade was expecting it. That increase came in a little bit higher than we thought, again, primarily because of higher yields coming out of the winter wheat belt. When we look at spring wheat, okay, spring wheat, um, we're looking at, a, again, a slight increase over what the trade was expecting. Again, not necessarily because of acreage, but the expectation is, and again, from the survey results that USDA provided us, a higher yield. And then the same thing with Durham. Not only was there a slight increase in, in planted acreage, but we also had some pretty good yield forecasts coming in for the Durham numbers. So again, some downward pressure. We in the middle of the uh, hard red winter wheat harvest. So we have some harvest pressure on pricing, but then we also get some little bit bigger numbers than we expected for the spring wheat in the Durham. So at the end of July, we also get these uh, the an update then based on the, the report for, um, um, for inventory. So we got the quarterly stocks report. I didn't report those numbers because there wasn't a lot of shift. But based on those, we'll then update, USDA will update what the, it believe the old crop ending stocks will be. And there's this is a reason this is the old, old crop. So this would be for the table for the grain that's in the bin right now for corn and soybeans. Uh, June 1, we started the new marketing year for wheat. So we don't have an official wheat estimate I mean, that, that wheat number has been um, officially closed out now. So we're still thinking about, well, how many bushels from last year's crop we're going to be able to carry forward. Um, based on our inventory numbers, there was some slight adjustments. And we did take, based on what the trade was expecting, we did take those ending stocks for corn from last year um, down a little bit, as well as down just a little bit for soybeans as well. So not big shifts, not big changes, but some adjustments and some refinement and fine tuning. The reason I bring this up is the inventories from last year get carried forward into the inventories for this year. They can be used in this new crop year as we bring in the, bring in the harvest. Okay. So now let's look at the 24, 25. So this is a crop that's growing in the, in the fields right now. Again, the consumption numbers are all forecast. We're having some little bit better estimates what the total production are gonna be. So the real question is, what do we expect to have in the bin this time next year? Okay, so when we look at all wheat, uh, because of the, again, uh, uh, larger yields, some uh, small adjustments when it came to the, the consumption numbers, a little bit higher export number, a little bit higher feed utilization. We are looking at an increase, uh, a slight increase in ending stocks for wheat based on what we thought we would see, again, which is a little bit negative in the marketplace. For corn, um, actually the corn ending stocks number came in very, very similar to what we saw in June. Um, so there was, based on the adjustments we had, not only from coming in, the bushels coming in from last year, but some small tweaks and adjustments, increased forecast for exports, a slight increase, um, excuse me, uh, uh, let me look at my notes here, a uh, slight increase in feed and residual, as well as a slight increase in exports. So our ending stocks number right now looks, based on today, at least with USDA's numbers, look very similar. Now, again, I want to caution everybody the USDA has not updated their yield forecast yet. That will happen in August. The same thing for soybeans, okay? The, the actual the soybean ending stocks number came in a little bit lower than what the trade was expecting, okay? But that's based off of trend line yields. So the mentality in the marketplace, what we see in the futures market, doesn't always match up with the numbers that we see in the USDA reports because of this timing difference. And the futures markets based on expectations. What do we expect to see? There really were no major changes in the South American production, just a small tweak in Argentine soybean numbers. Again, um, we're, we're, we're zeroing in on that number and the, and the Brazilians are just about done with their corn harvest, the Safrina corn harvest. So I don't really expect to, to hear a lot of new news coming out of South America for a little while yet. 
So looking forward now, what again, thinking about yields and yield expectations, um, I did want to throw up the drought monitor map. So if you look at the major corn, soybean and wheat producing regions, uh, the winter wheat here has already been harvested. So we got a pretty good idea of what the yields are there. Most of this central growing region from all the way from North Dakota into Nebraska, down into Missouri, um, Eastern Kansas, you get into the Corn Belt, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, you know, all of this from the drought monitor standpoint looks pretty good. You look at uh, crop vegetative health. And again, this is looking at the vegetative health today relative to history, try and give some longer term historical uh, perspective on it. Now, this is also overlaid with, with the drought monitor map. So, you know, how does the soil moisture play into um, this health, this, this vegetative health index? And if you notice, we get into southern Minnesota, parts of northern Iowa. There are some pockets up there where they are, they are extremely wet. Now, it doesn't, we'll have some drowned out, obviously, but, you know, there's still this thought and process in, their, in everybody's traders' brains that grain makes rain, right? Or rain makes grain, excuse me. And so the yield expectations right now, there's, a, there's only a few places in, in Indiana and um, in Illinois that are looking a little bit dry. There's parts of Louisiana, um, ex, uh, excuse me, Arkansas. That's, that's got some, some drier conditions showing up. But the heart of the Corn Belt, this heart of the Corn Belt is looking very, very good right now, which again is putting that kind of negative tone into the marketplace. How about looking forward for the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, weather forecast? When we look at National Weather Service, from a temperature standpoint, it looks like it's going to cool down a bit into the Midwest and especially into the Southern Plains. Again, Texas and Oklahoma have been exceptionally hot. Um, it looks like for the next six to 10 days, they're going to have below average temperatures. Now, again, average temperature in Texas right now is pretty still pretty warm. It's just they're not going to have the extreme heat that they've had over the last several, several months. When we look at precipitation, uh, especially as we get into the, into the middle of the Corn Belt, uh, it looks as though precipitation amounts will be about average to slightly above average, below average chance of precip, precip in Western North Dakota, as well as Western South Dakota. So right now, for very benign kind of weather forecast, it doesn't look like there's any major challenges on the horizon. And so right now, the buyers, if I'm an international buyer or domestic buyer looking at corn, soybeans or wheat, I'm not nervous at all. In fact, what I'm waiting for is some really good deals, right? I'm, I'm, if, if we get the crop that everybody thinks we have right now, you know, there's no rush or there's no hurry to be, to be able to buy or, or to try and, and forward price a bunch of the crop because it looks like we're going to have ample supplies. So as a result, we're starting to see these downward trends. This is as of about 1230 today. So this would be the December futures contracts. I put in the blue lines, which are those support and resistance levels, kind of those mental barriers. At least short term, it does look like we've put in a new low at about that 404, 405 level. So we're trading near the bottom of the range right now. Again, as I said, the expectations are for no major problems. We look at soybeans, kind of a similar kind of an, uh, uh, scenario. Now, from a pure technical st charting standpoint, we, it looked like we were putting in a low, although today we took another chug down, um, even though we did get some export sales numbers that came in that were, I, I think were favorable, but I guess it not a, uh, obviously a major shock to anybody. So the soybean market is still looking a bit soft. We may see a little bit downward, more, more downward movement. We'll have to wait to see over the next couple of days. Now, it does look like the spring wheat market has found at least, again, a temporary bottom for a while here with a slight rebound. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there's more, more conversations and discussions happening about global wheat supplies starting to tighten a little bit, primarily for, for production coming out of Russia, even though the Russian the people that buy Russian wheat don't necessarily buy, buy a lot of U.S. wheat. But just the fact that, that some of that wheat may not hit the marketplace is putting a little bit of support into the into the wheat market. So with that, um, that is the end of my formal presentation. Let me stop sharing here and I will hand things over to Tim Petrie. OK, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Today, I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, cyclical versus seasonal cattle prices 
particularly, uh, you know, at this time of the year on, on feeder cattle in particular, we're at relatively high levels, but, you know, the seasonal pattern is for them to go down. And last year, uh, in the fall of the year, even fed cattle went down a little uh, uh, con counter seasonal. And so I just want to mention, you know, and I've been talking about the cattle cycle in our previous presentations and saying year over year, we're going to be higher. We're higher than we were last year, 2025, probably higher. But to caution you that on a seasonal basis, prices can go down. And like they did last fall uh, for feeder cattle was was a, a normal situation. But there was concern that, uh, you know, that we had topped from a cattle cycle standpoint or that there uh, might be some, some other uh, issues going on there. And so I, I just want to cover the cycle versus uh, seasonal price patterns. So here's just the fed cattle price on a monthly basis. And so you see, at least in the right hand side of the chart, we are going up. We're in the, the uh, upward part of the price cycle, but month by month, prices do change and you see there by the end of 2023 that we uh, did have that decline. So uh, here is the cattle cycle and in the cattle cycle then we just measure year over year like I said. So you know we go back there to 2014-15 was our previous cyclical high and now 2024-2025 uh, we're expecting prices on a cyclical basis to be higher last year. They're higher this year. Also notice that we have about a 10 year cycle. Go back, you know, there's 2004 and five, we were cyclical high and then 14, 15 and now 24, 25. So the cycle is behaving uh, normal. And again, uh, cyclically, we're expecting higher prices uh, next year. However, we do have a seasonal price patterns that are very prevalent in the cattle industry, you know, due to supply and demand. So here's the seasonal price index for fed steers. And we like to use a, a 10 year uh, uh, index here because again, we have a 10 year cycle. So that should kind of take care of that. So I'll explain what this index is in a little bit more detail so that I don't have to explain it in the others. But all we do then for 10 years, in this case, the 2014 to, to 2023 average price for fed steers for January, we add those up and get an average February, March, and so on, and then divide by the year. And so we get, uh, uh, you know, an index there for the year. So in other words, uh, starting the year, you know, well, let's just go across from one. One is, is the average for the year. So whenever the red line is above one, it means they're above average for the year over that time period, at least. And that doesn't mean that they have to be uh, this year because uh, out of the unordinary things can affect the market and so on. But on the average for those 10 years, then uh, that red line above one means they're above average prices and the red line below one means they're below average prices. So we usually start out the year about 3% above average and then go up to about 6% above average in May. But by July, we fall down to, uh, uh, you know, five, 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 4% below the average or so on, but but quite a significant decline from May into midsummer and then uh, pick up throughout the year. So that's, uh, that's what the seasonal average is over that 10 year uh, time period. Now, also keep in mind then when we put the cyclical impact here, the prices are going up cyclically. So then, you know, that seasonal price index on the top, since we're in the increasing phase of the price cycle now, by the time we get to the end of the year, we could even be higher than we start off the year, even though they go down in the midsummer and so on, they could be higher or even could be higher than they were at that, that high back there in April or May. On the other hand, on the bottom, when we're in the downward part of the price cycle, then year over year prices 
even though they might sh should be higher in the fall and they do go up in the fall, they, they were lower than it starts. So just keep that in mind. We're in the increasing phase of the cycle now. So uh, year over year, we expect higher prices, but seasonally, again, they can go down. So here then are the actual prices, weekly prices to show you the variation weekly and then the, the cycle going on. So, you know, uh, 20... Uh, 21 is in green, 2022 is in purple, last year is in blue and red is this year, so you see cyclical higher. And then even on a seasonal basis, you see we're starting out the year and, and, and lower, we're ending, I guess I should go to, we're ending the year higher then we start the year because we're in the upward part of the, the price cycle. And so cyclical going up, but that doesn't mean uh, prices can't go down. And, uh, you know, they do go up in April or May and kind of fall off some. And then uh, last year, as I mentioned, we had this counter seasonal decline in fed cattle there in in November into December before they picked up in December for very good supply and demand uh, reasons. There wasn't a conspiracy in the market as some people were saying, you know, we've got low cattle numbers and we should be cyclical higher and the prices should be going up. And there were very good reasons for that decline. And uh, several of them are, first of all, we, we, by the end of the year, had a record number of heifers on feed because of the drought. Uh, feedlots were keeping uh, steers and heifers longer because, uh, well, corn prices were going down and replacement feeder cattle, as we see in a minute, were record high and in short supply. And so they were keeping them long. So we had record carcass weights. And so then beef production was higher than we expected during that time period. In fact, in some weeks, even higher than the year before. So that did uh, pressure prices uh, contra seasonally there for a little while and it even had some uh, impact as we'll see in a minute on the heavyweight feeder cattle but um, now uh, this year the red line again uh, we are cyclically higher than we have been last year and uh, you know our expectation is uh, although the futures market the, the red squares there are the futures market uh, again, they expect some seasonal decline, which, you know, usually does happen in the summer and and then it's some slight pickup. I think we can do better than that on fed cattle prices. The, the futures market is very cautious now, very volatile as well. Uh, the funds are all jittery as, you know, what's going to happen. And, and, you know, I see that that live cattle futures are down a, a over a couple dollars today. So very jittery there and, and they're very cautious. But from a cash standpoint, I think we can do better than those red bars, you know, with the lower supplies and demand has held very well, better than some expected. And if that continues, those gold uh, squares up there then are the 2025 futures. And you will notice the, the futures market is aware of the seasonal price pattern. So they say, okay, they, you know, there's the February futures. By the April futures, we go up. But by the June and August futures, we go down uh, uh, seasonally, but then pick up some at the end of the year. And again, I think for next year, the futures are very, very, very cautious and that we will likely be uh, cyclical higher and, and could very well be higher than those gold bars that are similar to this year, but the futures market is just being uh, uh, kind of cautious there. So here's the seasonal price index for steer calves, 550 to six weight steer calves. And again, uh, you know, based on supply and demand, the, uh, the prices usually start the year right about average and then go up to about 6% above the average in May. Uh, uh, 550 to six weight calves are in, relative short supply and maybe because uh, most of the calves are being born at that time. We don't have a lot of fall calves, uh, born calves that would weigh that. So we're in short supply. And then as long as grazing conditions are good, there's a really, really good demand in April or May for the lower supply of these lighter weight calves we have. And this year, much improved moisture conditions around the U.S. just starting with the Osage down there and in uh, Oklahoma and the Flint Hills of Kansas and the Sand Hills of Nebraska and the grasslands up to South Dakota and North Dakota all had much better moisture conditions. 
And, and so then they did a year ago. So that helped to spark uh, calf prices. And so they go down. But then, you know, this time of the year, the, there aren't very many sold. And the ones that are sold, uh, you know, are just kind of holdovers and leftovers and so on. So the market kind of fades down a little bit. And then by end of September, the, the calves start hitting the market again. And so we see that seasonal low in October year after year after year. And, and, and then some picking up. So prices going down in the fall of the year for calf prices are uh, are, 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 are seasonally normal, even though they could be, and as we see here, are cyclically higher. So, you know, here's the same years, again, as fed cattle that I showed you before in calves. You see the, you know, we're, we're moving higher every year. And uh, although they, uh, you know, there, there are some declines into the fall of the year, and we see that uh, last year, uh, we were at 290 there, you know, uh, uh, in, in a month or so from now last year, they dropped down to 270. And so that's a lot of concern saying, man, you know, uh, what happened there? We're, we should be cyclical higher. Calf prices right when I want to sell in, in October, November, they're off $20 or, or whatever. And that shouldn't happen. And is there a conspiracy? And that wasn't it at all. That's just a normal seasonal occurrence. On a percentage basis, that was a 7% drop. Uh, we had a 7% drop back in 2022. And uh, actually, they're back in 20. Uh, 21 from the uh, I think they're 180 down to 164 was a nine percent drop. Which so again the, the drop was was uh, uh, percentage wise was the same that it usually is. And so my expectation is again is that they will be lower this fall than they are now. A 550 to six weight steer calves. I think right now it looks like there's good support down there at at 310 or so in that area which again would be a around a seven percent drop again and you know we're going to have fewer supplies than we did last year and and uh, again as long as fed cattle hold and 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 so on so uh here's the seasonal index then for the heavier weight yearling prices and you see um they uh, tend to go down into march that's that calf crop moving through, you know, back here, uh, calf prices are low in October because that's when the big bunch of 550 to six weight calves are on the market. Then, uh, you know, we, that same group of calves by March, then weigh 750 to 800 pounds. So that tends to be the low. And then remember the seasonal low for fed cattle is more into June and July. That's those same year calves moving and, and the big bunch of them available in the midsummer there. So then, uh, calf, uh, these heavier weight yearling prices tend to move higher up into September, which really bodes well for summer grazing programs because, uh, uh, you know, these, these 800 pound, 700, 900 pound cattle coming off of pasture in September usually are a seasonal high, but then again, the seasonal pattern is for them to fall off as the market gets uh, a, a lot of, of seasonal pressure from calves coming to market and so on. And just one kind of aside here, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of, uh, of backgrounders, uh, that use livestock risk protection. Look at that end of August, September time period as a good time to put on an LRP contract for the March uh, cattle coming out because of that, uh, that seasonal pattern. So here's the actual prices again, no surprise here, cyclically higher every year. Uh, last year, that uh, decline after the, that uh, September high was a little bit more than uh, in magnitude than normal. But again, that was back to the fed cattle that went down counter seasonally uh, with their, with the pressure. And so they fell down uh, maybe a little more, but, but again, the, the, for them to go down from September on is normal, just maybe a little more than normal. Here we're again this year, moving along cyclically uh, higher. And uh, and uh, the, uh, the there's the futures, you know, indicating that by end of the fall that we will be uh, higher than we were last year, uh, although uh, be maybe seasonal lower than they are now. So go to cows, 
same we have a seasonal very distinct seasonal pattern there again starting out the year below average but quickly increasing seasonally as as the cows get closer to calving and uh, you know once they calve there in the midsummer not many uh, cows are sold and so you know they just plug along there at high levels because there's a good demand for hamburger and lean beef but the supply of cows on the market are down but when the pg checking starts and in the fall again we have that big uh, crash in prices down into the fall of the year when all the cows that are open or are, are uh, you're, you know we wean the calves and and the cows come to to market so a very distinct seasonal pattern there and here's the actual prices again as i've showed you before just moving uh cyclically higher year after year but you know after august into september that a uh, big decline and uh, you know we're uh cow slaughter is down 17 percent this year so we're seeing a really really uh nice cow prices here just want to uh caution you know you know, we're up there around 128 or whatever and i have produced telling me oh i'm selling cows for 150 or 149 or whatever it might be and and i know you know that these are just average prices and this series that i use these 85 to 90 percent lean prices are thin they're old they're they're broken mouth cows that have had a had a, a calf on them and so they would tend to be at the low of the market but younger or fleshier better yielding cows I know are bringing very good prices now up, uh, you know, 160 or whatever. But, you know, again this year, uh, after here a month or so, we can expect the uh, cow prices to decline again like they uh, always do in the fall is, is a seasonal thing. Even though, you know, we're going to be cyclically higher in prices, they'll be higher than last year this fall. They'll be still lower than they are now as the other market classes. So, again, I just wanted to kind of have you uh, uh, remember that that uh, cyclical versus seasonal we're cyclically we're going to be higher but don't forget the seasonal price patterns and they hold true typically year after year and so prices can uh, go down uh, due to supply and demand fundamentals and and uh, no conspiracy there so with that i will stop sharing and turn it over to ron okay i'm just going to have a Few minutes here to talk about the emergency relief program the 2022 program um there was never an, a deadline announced uh when we were in uh in the in the uh, fa uh the um phase one and phase two and um so or the track one and track two i should say and uh so they finally announced a deadline now and it is august 14th 2024 now people had already gotten money earlier on the track one um, so they may not probably wouldn't expect too much on, on the track two. Uh, and with most people, nobody really does anything till there's a deadline. So now, now there is one. So you better get better get uh, cracking if you're going to do something. Uh, a quote from the FSA administrator. Don't delay. Gather up your documents and contact your local FSA offices off to complete your application. OK. Uh, just as a quick review, this goes way back to 2022 when the president signed a, signed a, uh, appropriations uh, to help pay for losses that occurred in 2022. There really wasn't enough money to cover all the losses, uh, so they will be rationing that out. Um, it, as an overview, remember that people would all automatically got paid some money under the track one. Uh, uh, it was just they had pre-filled forms that they sent out. And this was based on the crop insurance uh, that you had elected for that crop. And, and track two is what we're considering right now. Um, what it did, it bumped up your crop insurance levels um, to a higher amount based on this chart. Um, for those that didn't have crop insurance, track two, probably more of an app to collect some money uh, if you get this filled out in, in time. There was a little controversy on this one. People were complaining because they because there wasn't enough money. They factored down the higher payments more than the lower payments what you would have gotten. Um, so, uh, but that's just the way the rule was, um, and uh, that's what we ended up with. That's this. This is the called the progressive factoring chart. So, getting to track two now. 
There is two options available, the tax year option, where you actually pull information from your tax returns, from your gross income, and then the expected revenue option. FSA has done webinars on both of these two options. Um, they are posted. You can grab them and, and refresh your memory if you've forgotten about it by now. Um, the tax year option, you basically check, uh, uh, elect um, your income from either 18 or 19 as your benchmark and compare it to 22 or 23, okay? And that's why they were holding off on a deadline. People probably hadn't gotten their 2023 taxes prepared probably until now. Under the expected revenue option, which is probably simpler for most, they don't have to dig into their tax returns. They can just come up with a, an expected revenue, what they, what they would have expected to get in 2022 compared to what they actually got in 2022 expected revenue option. The two options under track two. Uh, this is a chart that just, this, just a table that just explains the two under the tax year option. You pick the pick the benchmark year and you pick the, uh, uh, your, um, your revenue elected year. And then under the expected revenue, you, 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 f you figure out what you would expect to, expected to have gotten based on history and what you actually got. And so remember now, the deadline is August 24th. Um, there are fact sheets available online and, and, you know, and at FSA offices for you to review to get you up to speed on this. So we don't want you to miss this deadline. And with that, I will entertain questions at the end. And so that's all I had for today. So I will stop sharing and turn it uh, directly over to um, David. Thanks, Ron. So I just have some uh, brief comments about sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, gotten a lot of questions about it the last week. Been attending field days at research extension centers, preparing to get mine on today in Langdon. Uh, so I thought I'd share a bit uh, of, of news as well as some related information. Uh, so yesterday, Reuters had an article come out uh, reiterating something that the Energy Information Administration (EIA) had released and it, it was estimates of the increase in capacity of domestic uh, sustainable aviation fuel uh, production capacity. So I mean, it's really uh, a, a tremendous increase from 2,000 to 30,000 barrels per day. Again, this is capacity, not uh, actual production, although it'd be likely that they would produce somewhere near that amount. Uh, converting that over to something that might be a bit more understandable, uh, that'd be 30 million gallons per year to 460 million gallons per year. That is uh, relative to U.S. jet fuel consumption. About this, it's like 1.875 percent. It's actually, to me, uh, a relatively sizable amount. And if we look at uh, or compare that to uh, biodiesel production or even corn ethanol production, that's that's a that's a nice jump uh, for a pretty young industry. Uh, all of this growth is going to come from hydro treating. Uh, so this would be like it, uh, the same way we make renewable diesel for the most part. So hydro-treated vegetable oil could be vegetable oil, fat, or grease. Um, just doing some quick math, uh, the amount of material needed is substantial. Um, the production capacity that's expected to require, you know, almost 4 billion pounds of feedstock, which would be about 300 million bushels of soybeans or one and a half years of, or one and a half times the, the North Dakota annual soybean crop. So it's a lot of oil uh, for this build out. And again, the, the size of the South market is, is substantially smaller than renewable diesel, biodiesel, or corn ethanol. Um, also to note too, it, it, there's two primary pathways of producing sustainable aviation fuel. So this hydro treating uh, pathway with, with lipids, with fats, and then the alcohol to jet pathway. Um, there's only one al alcohol to jet facility in operation that's in, in Georgia, and it's 20 million gallons per year, which is a pretty good size uh, non-corn ethanol uh, facility. So it, 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 it's sizable. And I, and I know that the, the idea behind that business is that they would like to build many, many additional uh, facilities around that size uh, across the country. Um, just to give a little bit more information uh, on this expansion, it's it's interesting. So... This would be a Phillips 66 uh, renewable diesel SAF refinery in Rodeo, California. 
um, primarily renewable diesel, but uh, also having some some of that capacity for SAF. You know, obviously the, those are those sizable amounts, but I thought it was also interesting too that they have signed offtake agreements with British Airways and Southwest. Um, those are kind of interesting. It's also interesting that, you know, a, a, a buying group, there's a consortium of global airlines who've uh, this agreed to buy many of the credits produced by, uh, produced with this SAF fuel, I mean, giving it a home. The other piece of uh, news that doesn't have a place here on the screen is actually that Microsoft had helped buy a number of credits for from Philips 66 to offset their emissions with the thought that it would offset flights between London and Seattle. And again, this kind of goes to that broader ESG movement or, you know, kind of some action behind that kind of thought process of large multinational corporations thinking about climate and doing something. In this case, it would be Microsoft buying credits uh, and or fuel from Philips 66 to offset their actual jet travel. Um, the other project is in is in Texas, Port Arthur's around Houston, uh, around the same size. This is just a, a, an expansion of an existing facility. I think it's really important to note too. So again, we think about the amount of oil that would be needed. Uh, it's considerable. Um, and then these facilities are just just less in the case of Philip 66 and more than that for the case of Diamond Green, bigger than uh, Marathon Dickinson, which is a very large facility, also bigger than Theraldson corn ethanol refineries in terms of gallons. And these are these are monstrous refineries. And again, we'll be consuming a lot of vegetable oil in coming years. And, and the expectation is, you know, we're just in the early stages. And in my observation, I'm, I'm quite excited, surprised that this is happening so quickly. Uh, and in part, it is supported by some global initiatives led by the airlines, some actions by the EU. And then also we have a very uh, relatively generous tax credit for either sustainable aviation fuel production or clean fuel production. Both of those tax credits are a little bit bigger uh, than there had been in the past for biodiesel or other things, uh, and a bit of an upside. And so there's me, this is kind of some observation that this policy had had some had some pull in it, helped uh, make these things happen. Uh, the other two things that are really important to note for both 40B, which is the SAF tax credit, it actually only lasts through this year, and then 45Z, which will replace it, is they both allow the incremental decrease in greenhouse gas emissions to be incentivized. And so as an economist, that's ideal. So if we're going to price every little bit of reduction, we think that the market would work effectively to incentivize refineries and others to make those changes uh, instead of having uh, kind of a larger step or jump uh, for, for making changes. And then also, too, it allows farm level practices to be considered. And this is a, you know very much new for federal policy. The tax credit goes to the biorefineries, but farms themselves who have low carbon feedstocks, you know, they should have enough oomph to capture some of that that premium that or that tax credit that that refinery might have. There's not a great deal of commodities that can actually qualify based on the IRS's rules, but a really kind of an exciting place where we're at. Um, there's a little bit of work. Uh, on those going forward, uh, as well as continued modeling with the life cycle assessment, especially 45 D, the rules haven't been put out yet. Um, but together, they both played a, a bit of a role in this build out of our SAF production capacity. Um, and then, of course, we'll see how it plays out in terms of the production and marketing of, of crops. Um, that's all that I had for my remarks. Uh, with that, we'll open the floor up to questions. Again, you can use the chat or the Q&A tool. Um, and we'll leave it open for a few minutes um, for, for any questions. And I would like to thank everybody for attending. It, it, there were a number of participants for mid-July. Everybody must have good air conditioning now, because if you know, 50 years ago, <laughs> plugged in. Yeah. 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 If I can make 
Yeah, if I can make one comment while while people are thinking just really quick here. Um, I, I, I checked a little bit while others were, were speaking and <clears throat> question I sometimes get is, so what happens with the these outside money guys? What happened with, you know, where are they sitting right now with their positions? Um, for corn, um, the, the, the outside investment community, what we call the managed money funds, are at a record short position right now. So that when we talk about record short, that includes um, positions they have not only in the futures markets, the different contract months, but also in the options markets. So the funds right now are net short, meaning there are more sellers than there have been buyers from that group or that pool of, of traders, and they are net short at a record level. Um, the other group, uh, the other one is for soybeans. They're not record short yet, but they're very close to being a record short position. And this is the outside money that comes in and invests. And then when, when the market shifts, they also shift their investment per portfolio and they can start buying as quickly as they're selling. So right now what's happening is, again, we're seeing this downward pressure in prices. Uh, the outside investment community is kind of jumping onto that bandwagon. Typically, what we see is when there's some kind of fundamental shift and prices start to rise, a lot of those, those outside investors will start reversing their positions. And so we can see a, a rally or an increase in prices. So what I always try and remind people is that these outside investment community can make the price swings a little more aggressive, either upwards or downwards, but they don't necessarily make that underlying shift. It's usually some kind of fundamental change. So the language I use is that the outside investment community are trend followers. They're not trend makers. They don't necessarily change the trend, but they do follow it as, as it comes along. So just uh, in the back of people's minds, again, there's a lot of downward pressure in prices right now. And a lot of that's just expectations about a large crop. So I just wanted to update that because that is something I get a questions on periodically is where are those managed funds and how are they sitting right now today? Yeah, and I, I don't see any, other, any questions up on the board. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank the presenters and everyone who attended today. We will be back next month, uh, August 15th, uh, the Thursday after the WASD comes out. So I hope everybody has a, a great July and early August, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Bye.